I think you can make jokes about anything, um, but you have to accept that there will be people who don't like it. Gee, Paul, what does that sound like? When the audience doesn't like what you said, what does it sound like? It's called a dead room, Paul. Sometimes we kill it, sometimes it's just dead. But the sound is unmistakable to every comedian. We don't need to be reminded to accept it. How many regular working comedians know what it's like to bomb horribly? Have, how many have at some point in their career stood in front of an audience, got through their routine and done nothing but die on their ass? It's 100%, Paul. It is as inevitable as the sun rising. No matter how funny you are, you will experience the trial of the dead room. And it's an absolutely mortifying experience. That's why there are Marines and Navy SEALs out there who would not dare to dream of doing what we do. It's that fucking frightening, Paul. And you're talking to comedians like they don't understand how rejection works. Comedians who, don't, who can't accept rejection do not become comedians. They experience one dead room and they give it up. Or they experience five dead rooms and think, fuck it, I can't handle another hundred of these. You know, because someone informed them that, that you will get a hundred of these. But you're not talking about dead rooms, are you, Paul? You're not talking about an audience in which zero people are laughing, are you? You're talking about an audience in which 99 people are laughing their asses off and one person is getting offended but they are the right kind of person and they are getting offended for the right reasons. For the politically correct reasons. You're not telling that one offendee that they need to accept the merriment of the other 99 people. You're telling those 99 people that they are wrong to be laughing and that this whole show needs to be shut down because of that one cunt in the audience who doesn't like the word cunt. That's what's happening, isn't it, Paul? You're on the heckler's side now. The heckler gets to shut the show down as long as the heckler has the correct opinions and is higher on the progressive stack than the comedian in question. Let's face it. Um, and they are completely within your, their rights, just as you are completely within your rights to say whatever you want to say they're within their rights to react how they're going to react. Paul, what does it look like when someone doesn't have the right to speak? It's the in practice. What, what does it look like? What are, the, what are the discernible properties of that setup? It's when that person is punished for speaking. That is not having the right to speak. When they can get ejected from the venue, by threat of force for speaking. Incidentally, if that is your rule, if it is your mandate, it would be awfully ethical of you to be upfront about it. In stage performance, we are upfront about it. Everyone knows the rules before they go in. In the context of a theatrical performance, you don't have equal free speech rights to the performer. If someone in the audience is making loud noises, persisting after several warnings and severely distracting the rest of the audience, then that person will be forcefully ejected by the security staff. This is a necessary feature of this dynamic. The dynamic of performer and performed too. It's not a fucking seminar. It's not a fucking panel. It's a show. I, it doesn't change the law of the land outside, but within the confines of a private venue, the performer has more right to speak than any individual in the audience, because the performer is obliged to speak, obliged by all the other individuals in the audience and their dollar, if applicable. The same dynamic applies when you scale this up from live venue to broad scene. So why, Paul, are you telling us that a heckler has the same free speech rights as the performer they're heckling when they necessarily fucking do not. If they did, comedy would not be possible. 
It would just be a crowd of people making utterly incoherent noise at one person. That's not comedy. That's putting someone in the stocks and pelting them with shit and fruit. There's no middle ground here. It's either comedy or public humiliation torture. That's why we have to give the comedian more rights than the audience, because comedy is better than public humiliation torture. In my opinion, anyway. I don't watch any of that Simon Cowell shit. So how exactly the fuck do you still get to call yourself a comedian, Paul, when you have publicly and officially defected from Team Comedy and are now playing in goal for Team Pitchfork? So you can't be surprised or insulted if someone doesn't like a thing you said. But some random cunt in the audience can, Paul. Some dickhead can wander in off the street and be as surprised and insulted as they like and then complain to the management and get the show shut down. But the comedian doesn't get to be surprised or insulted by that. By losing their job. Nor can the rest of the audience be surprised or insulted by losing the show they paid for. What in Jiminy fucksticks are you doing, Paul? That is a con- uh, that you- And why don't you sound very confident? You, you know, you're making jokes on a controversial topic. Yes, that's a comedian's job! An adult comedian, anyway. If Barney the fucking dinosaur started talking about raping Jews and making soup out of babies, that would be a legitimate cause for disciplinary action. But if you go to an adult comedy show expecting a big purple plushie to sing a song about a happy cloud while waving its inoffensive purple dick in your face, then congratulations, you now understand the difference. Adult comedy, Paul, is controversial. Adults do not fucking find things funny unless they're controversial. Come on, I think of it either to children. They just find normal shit controversial because they don't know what the fuck they think yet. Do, do you see, Paul? If a child accidentally wanders into an adult comedy event, they hear a rape joke and they start crying, the correct response is not to shut the whole fucking show down, Paul. It is to get that kid out of there, quietly and gently and as soon as possible, and give them some fucking juice or something, and find their parents. The solution does not change. If instead of dealing with a child, we are dealing with an extremely childish adult. And that is what we're dealing with. Punters who suffer from what can rather charitably be described as severely arrested development of the emotional intelligence. Cunts, basically. They're so enamoured with their own sense of moral superiority that they actively resent other people's happiness. They used to be rare specimens, but with each generation, they're getting more and more numerous for whatever reason. But listen to me, Paul. We are not going to change the fundamental dynamic of comedy just because we're surrounded by evil retards now. The rule is the same. If you are a soft-headed cry-bully prick, then adult comedy is not for you. There is the door. Barney still loves you. Go to him. I think there's a lot of people... Uh who court that and they want that. What? Controversy, Paul. Some comedians court controversy. What? When did this happen? Because it's, it's attention. It, it gets more uh, eyeballs on them and what they're doing. It's their fucking job, Paul. It's your fucking job to deserve the attention of people's eyeballs. Why are you describing your own art like it's a fucking character defect. How did this happen to you? My God, man! Um, but there's some people who do feign outrage at this. I should have asked this question a long time ago because the answer is already obvious. What's the difference between rage and outrage? They're exactly the same thing. We just call it rage when we do it, and outrage when the out group does it. 
I'm no less guilty. I've, you know, I've done it myself frequently. I call my thing rage and their thing outrage. The truth is it's all just rage. It's all in rage. Everyone's rage is equal. Except in designed and designated communication dynamics, such as performance art, in which case the comedian is indeed doing the rage and the fucking heckler is doing the outrage. Or they're genuinely feeling like, how dare you tell me what I can and cannot joke about? I think it is genuine, Paul, yes. I think there are indeed some people who genuinely have a problem with censorship. Thanks very much for throwing that freaking bone in there. But I would say in most cases, audiences are not telling them you can't joke about this. What they are saying is that wasn't funny. I can't begin to tell you how close my irony fuse is to melting, Paul. Let's <laughs> see that again. That wasn't funny. That was your Uncle Sam moment, Paul. <laughs> you're a fucking comedian. And this is what you're doing with your life now. And with the fucking big think watermark in the corner, look, no left. It's like when Gavin McInnes started telling dads to build tables while a rebel watermark hung in the bottom right corner. And now this shit. That wasn't funny. <laughs> I can't wait to see what the other two corners are going to be. <laughs> I think I'm rediscovering the four humours using irony. <laughs> or is it the four ironies using humour? <laughs> Who knows? Ah! And that's a different thing. Paul, I've already told you what the difference is between that wasn't funny and you can't joke about that. The sound of that wasn't funny is a dead room. The sound of, you can't joke about that, is one little dick pigeon in an otherwise happy audience standing up and literally yelling, you can't joke about that. It's just a fucking heckler, Paul. They don't get more veto power than any other heckler, than the guy who just stands up and yells, I fucked your mother. You don't get special treatment just because you have less self-awareness than that guy. You can make me laugh at a thing that affects me personally, but if you've done your homework and you've gone about it the right way, it will still be funny. What does that mean? Don't you, what does that mean? Doing your homework is counterproductive if the teacher is teaching you nothing but bullshit. Your homework has no fucking authority here, it's comedy. You don't even need a high school diploma. They don't even care about a fucking drama degree. I've tried. They think I'm saying dromedary. <laughs> they get all excited because they think I have one. But it's when people do, I think, a lazy job at something. They're not trying as hard as they could. Or they really are just courting outrage. Okay, what would be really helpful here, crucial even, would be an example of what you're talking about. You people hate giving such examples. <clears throat> Because you don't actually know where to draw the line. You want everything to be potentially behind the line. You want the whole fucking thing to be made of line. So I'm going to be the helpful one and supply an actual example from reality. I've done a lot of open mic nights and there was this one guy once, sort of lanky uh, middle-aged guy, had a nerdy uh, character act. So it's supposed to be like that, it's obviously a character. And uh, one of his jokes was, Pedophilia leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Especially in the kid's mouth. And yeah, my reaction was probably like yours. Ugh. Like, 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 like me. And of course the room remained just dead. For twas already a dead room. <clears throat> and I don't think I, I don't think I did speak to that guy afterwards. I can't remember. But if I did, you know, I would have told him. That joke probably won't do you any favors. Really lazy for a pedophilia joke. If you're going to go pedophile and leave it something lazy and obvious like that, I, uh, totally not worth it, in my opinion, anyway. Keep doing it if you like, I'm just saying. In my estimation, that joke will probably never see any room but a dead room. Notice the crucial phrases I used there. In my opinion and in my estimation. I get to opine, I get to estimate, but I do not get to demand. 
I do not get to censor. I can say I don't think many people will find that funny, but I don't get to say I don't think many pe people will find that funny, therefore you're not allowed to say it. And that is what you're tiptoeing around, sir, the heckler's veto. And fuck you. Your predictions do not dictate my mandate. Your predictions mean nothing. This is art. And if that lanky nerdy guy with this shit pedophile joke said to me, I thank you for the advice, but I like my joke, I'm going to tell it to as many dead rooms as I can handle, then I will shake his hand and buy him a drink, because that's a fucking comedian right there. That's an artist. And like this pitchfork-wielding prick right here. That's when audiences say that wasn't funny. But I think it's so rare, it's so rare that anyone says you're not allowed to joke about that. Bill Burr, I choose you! It's absolute ridiculous bullshit. But hang on. I, I can't stand people who everything's funny, then the shit comes around to them, and then all of a sudden they, you know, they stop saying it's jokes, they say it's statements. But is it worth it? Yes. Even if a killer whale gets blasted to the moon, it will still be funny. <laughs> you can't stop the funny. It's like stopping the rhythm. It's impossible, Paul. Give it up. And over time, people who are uh, tired of being ashamed because a thing happened to them. Make jokes about it. And I think that comedians have to recognize that humor evolves and times change and you can't stay stuck in the same place for too long because then you're irrelevant. Oh, indubitably, Paul, indubitably, unequivocally. And this doesn't need to be enforced by any deus ex machina. It is entirely self-organizing and emergent. No one individual can cast any aspersion on what the audience at large will do any more than a single starling can determine what the flock will do. So if someone comes along trying to enforce it, then that person is trying to fuck up the natural order. And you can't stay stuck there for too long <laughs> because then you're irrelevant. Your video has an approval rating of less than 50%, Paul. Are you going to listen to that audience or is that audience wrong? That audience is wrong, isn't it, Paul? That's what political correctness comes down to. It gives you the right to say not only that the audience is wrong to like the things you don't like, but it's even wrong not to like the things you do like. What are those things, Paul? It's hard to say. I don't mean it's difficult to describe. I mean, it's difficult to get away with it. But I'll get us there with a little bit of help from my friends. Um, I was halfway through writing this script uh, when, when Harmful Opinions did his excellent uh, response to the same video. And he made an interesting observation upon which I shall expand. Link in the lower bar. Do check out his channel. If you think I've got a cool voice, be prepared for wibbly things in your trouser. <laughs> this guy's voice was made in a lab in a volcano on Mars. There's this amazing clip of uh, Patrice O'Neill. The first thing I ever saw of him, I went back to watch it writing this script and holy shit the guy in this video paul f tompkins sounds just like you know what's happening now is the marketplace okay is deciding what's appropriate or what's not appropriate it's i think the nation is just tired there's a new mood in the nation what nation the nation you know what we're tired of things that it's are just a nation this paper and you I'm, I'm not right right it's the same fucking thing. What's gone wrong? Why is a comedian on that side of this argument? In Do this you country, think they were trying to be our funny? Entire, you know what? I don't care if they're trying to be funny. Why is a comedian siding with the new wave of people like this who are even worse? It's exactly the same bullshit that's been thrown around for ages. Just today, it's coming out of a comedian's mouth. Listen to this. They can go out and try to be as funny as they want, make as much funny make as much money being as funny as they want. This is what's happening. There is a change in this country. People are realizing they it's have an opportunity to speak out. You might not even know the half of it there, fellow. <laughs> you think it's a recent development for comedians to start saying this shit? Let us return to that very same episode of The Green Room. 
You get to say whatever you want. We all get to, right? Absolutely. But the second it comes out of our mouths, it's no longer in our control about how it's supposed to be interpreted. No. It's in your control, Liz. People can hate it. They can do whatever you want. So every time you say something, like I always say, the only thing I promise my audience is that I wrote something I care about. I say it because I believe it. The second it comes out of my fucking mouth, all you can hate it. You can write your Congress people. You can call your network. And that's the bottom line is that we all have to deal with the shit that comes to us from saying what we say. That's Liz Winstead. Co-creator and original head writer of The Daily Show. From the people who brought you John Stewart and Stephen Colbert. This isn't new. <laughs> the people at the top of the business have been thinking like this for some time. The people who actually run the media are telling us, well, if the media doesn't like you, you gotta go. <laughs> but you are the media. No, I'm not. Uh, straight white men are the media. <gasps> the plot thickens. Might this explain why when women and minorities are criticized, those criticisms can be disregarded as sexist and racist, while when white people and men are criticized, they simply have to accept that backlash. <laughs> and anyone of any race or gender who doesn't fall in line with our mandate must also accept that backlash. This is why we don't trust the concept that you call political correctness, because that is just a euphemism. It means acceptable prejudice. Quite a lot of people don't quite know the difference between not being racist and sexist and being racist and sexist against the correct people. Particularly one's own people. Oh, there might be something rather dark in the human condition at play here. It's quite possible that we find it easier to hate someone than to hate no one. So much so that we would rather hate ourselves than hate no one. And if you can convince a black lesbian that it's impossible for her to hate black lesbians, then she'll accept it and cling to it. She'll have all the warmth and the glow from the everlasting friction of hatred, but in her head she hates no one. She's just there going, yeah, no, I don't hate anyone, I just stick pins in my eyes for fun. Furthermore, if you can convince her that it is institutionally impossible for anyone to hate black lesbians, <laughs> fuck only knows what she'll do to herself. Probably build an empire or something. And you might be a person of yesterday if you can't adjust and you can't be in tune with what... Uh, people think is is funny anymore well political correctness isn't funny paul fuck off with it you sniveling little yesterday person political correctness as i said is just the protracted extrusion of prejudice against men hence it's no coincidence that its proponents are mostly men with no backbone and women with two and it's not funny, Paul. It's the oldest trick in the book. It's the lamest sitcom in the schedule. Fuck off with it, okay? People are different. Nothing is sacred. Get over it. You know, it's all part of a, of a, a, a maturation process, I think, for everybody. And I, I, I'm of the school that says adapt or die, you know? I'm of the school that just says adapt. And so if this is not a thing that we joke about anymore, I'm going to find something else to joke about. Or, or, or I'm, going to, I'm going to be better at handling these subjects so that people know what my intent is. <laughs> you cannot possibly predict the kind of intentions that will be read into your act willy-nilly by these professional fucking umbrage takers. Your intentions will never be clear when it comes to borderline personality disorders. It's how they think. It's what they do instead of thinking. They make shit up, Paul, and they are never satisfied. Every concession you give them just makes them smell blood. It makes them hungry for more, and they will keep fucking nibbling until they have eaten you. Piranhas, Paul! You're picturing piranhas, aren't you? My intent is not to mock the victim here. It's not to mock the little person. <gasps> are you calling midgets victims? 
Or did I just call it? Little people is synonymous with victims, right? Wrong, Paul. Big people can be victims too. If there was any consistency to the concepts of political correctness, it would in some capacity contain an acknowledgement of that counterintuitive truth. But no, not only is it considered perfectly politically correct to act with brazen prejudice against men because they're bigger, it is considered politically incorrect to have any problem with this, to stand up for men against such brazen prejudice, perhaps by telling jokes about it and whatnot. And you've taken on the role of enforcer against the free speech rights of men. <laughs> Let's face it, feminist comedians aren't being censored for, for their views about men, unless those views aren't harsh enough. And I mean, you're not going after daytime TV hosts, are you? You're going after adult comedians who just happen to be mostly male. Like, like you're not going after TV in general. You're just going after adult video games, which just happen to be a mostly male market. You, Paul, have adopted the role of enforcer against comedy. I, perhaps you're happy with that role, perhaps you're not, but a lot of us would prefer to remain in the role of comedian. I'm, I'm ridiculing something that is worthy of ridicule, and that every word out of my mouth is worth saying. That's what everyone thinks, Paul! It's called a conscience! You are not the only man in the world who has one! In fact, if that's what you think, then you are one of the few who does not. And... You know, just not to be cheap, I think, is, is a tiny thing, but it's, it's kind of important. Paul, cheap is not just a tiny thing. It is nothing. In finance, it is everything, but in art, it is nothing. It is arbitrary and subjective to the point of vanishing. There is no measurable currency to artistic worth. If you're going to claim something is important, then it had better fucking be something that bloody exists. Otherwise, you get to wander into any comedy show, declare it as too cheap, and the whole shebang gets shut down without anyone having any fucking clue what they did wrong. It's bedlam, Paul. It's utter fucking chaos. It's a sign of the totalitarianism to come, when books can be burned and speakers can be silenced for absolutely no discernible fucking reason other than Big Brother doesn't like this. Fuck you, Paul. You're an agent of destruction in Agent of Creation's clothing. And you know, we're fine with Agents of Destruction. We approve of you in ways sheep certainly don't approve of wolves. So we would very much appreciate it if you would stop lying and admit that you are here to destroy things, to ruin people's fun, because their idea of fun is not your idea of fun. Because your idea of fun is flagellating yourself to sleep at night. I mean, that's fine, Paul. But it's not the only path. There is a way to create comedy in which the joke isn't at anyone's expense. You just let comedians talk. All comedians. Then the expense is on everyone. And when the expense is on everyone, you all realise there isn't even a fucking expense. It's laughter. It costs nothing and heals everything. You want it to cost everything and heal nothing. Well, for the as manyth time as I have to say it, fuck you, pitchfork cunt. Comedians don't want you and neither do audiences. Goodbye and think off. You big fuck. That whole thing I thought was bullshit.